pushing ahead with the use of ultrasound in reducing maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality. And I think um, uh, uh, this is why I've become interested in fetal brain scan. Um, I will tell you a little bit story about this. Um, so I will start uh, today's uh, workshop with a, a brief overview as to why we need to do a, a brain scan in a very comprehensive manner. And these are my disclosures. I will not do all of them. But of course, first of all, I would love to advertise. <laughs> so um, this year, our World Congress will be in Hungary. And it will be in September. And please submit your abstract. Uh, the due date is the 18th of March. And why it's, uh, why it's a good idea to submit your abstract is because uh, we will start to raise your professional profile. It gets published in the White Journal. And you get to attend the Congress. And then you are going to make a difference in clinical care. And these are the key dates, uh, highlighting the, the uh, submission deadline for uh, the abstract, and, and early bird deadline is the 14th of July, and so forth. Without further ado, let me move on to the main topic. Um, for me, it was fascinating because I returned to Hong Kong uh, almost eight years ago. You know, I was working in, in London for many years, and I was privileged to work at King's because at King's, um, uh, we could consider a termination of pregnancy, even late in pregnancy. And if I see a case with severe hydrocephalus at 38 weeks, I would gather uh, uh, an NDD board, uh, you know, a neurologist, a geneticist, MR, etc., to then uh, prognosticate for, for this fetus, and then we can consider uh, ending the pregnancy at 38 weeks. But in Hong Kong, the law is very strict. And um, actually, in the UK, it's also very strict. But it just happens that uh, in, in, uh, in my previous unit, we were uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a position where we could have provided a multidisciplinary approach. And then, so um, uh, when I first started in Hong Kong, I, I was obviously baffled as to how I should counsel a case of mild ventricular malady diagnosed at 20 weeks. The trouble is that you can't really prognosticate. It is an isolated ventricle medley, meaning that you've done an amnio, there's no infection, there's no underlying chromosome abnormality. But you need to talk about progression. A third of the chance that it will be okay, a third of the chance that it will worsen, and a third of the chance that it will improve. And then, at that time juncture, because it's before 24 weeks, you need to make a decision. You need to, you need to touch on the topic of ending the pregnancy, even though there's not a lot to talk about. It's very, very um, upsetting for the parents. You're not giving enough information. And I recognize that a standard uh, uh, transabdominal scan was only providing limited views of, of, of the brain, and then I did not have any markers of prognostication. For me, it was a wake-up call. I cannot rely on MR at 20 weeks because, you know, doing MR at that gestation is not really informative. But I did not have the luxury of waiting until 32 weeks because by then, if it's terrible, if there's severe ventricular magnitude, there is, listen carefully, it's too late to end the pregnancy. So mid-trimester scanning is essential and therefore I know I need it too. I knew I needed to improve my scanning skills. And so I decided to set up a fetal neuroscan service, just a quick run through of, of what uh, the key um, uh, of the approaches. You need to really go and learn from an expert. And I was lucky enough to learn from Winsor Kupu. And then uh, you need to make sure that you have the appropriate equipment and transducers. You need to optimize your presets for both 2D and 3D scanning. Not just 3D, you need to also optimize your 2D room time screen scanning. There's a learning curve. I mean, some people will take two scans. Some people will take three months. I think at most, it will take you six months to really grasp the orientation with a transducer uh, to be done, you know, to do a transvaginal scan. It's actually very, very different from a transabdominal scan. And it's, a, and it's a scan that requires fetal manipulation. This is also challenging. In a country where by the way, has, you know, the scan is, is done by sonologists, and, and sometimes they may not be so comfortable to manipulate the fetus. Basically, if I have one hand holding the transducer, my other hand is moving the fetus, so to bring the two together. And then, so, because my two hands are already occupied, 
then I need a third and a second, a second person to, to press the button. So it's two persons yet. You, while you pick up the skills for visual neurosonography, you also need to train your buttonologist. So that's also very important. And that person has to be very good with playing video games because the speakers is going to move around very, very quickly. And, my, and if you ever come to my clinic, my, my students are very fast. And it's, it's actually something I learned in London as well. When I started 20 years ago, I know I looked way too young for this, but 20 years ago when I, when I learned from Kipros, the 11 to 14 week scan, I was given three seconds to detect transcuspid regurgitation. Three seconds gone, the fetus is moved because you have turned on pal darker. Yes, pal, uh, the, uh, the color darker. And then, downstairs fibrosis, I had three seconds to do it. So I was trained to play the piano on a machine. I never looked down. I knew where the buttons were, and I was pressing the button without looking down. And my, my, my left hand is scanning as well. So this is something that is quite challenging for fetal brain because, you know, it's, it's more than just getting to DR, more than just getting to spinosis. Anyhow, fetal brain imaging optimization, just want to share some of the tips and then some of the tools that uh, you may get to see later on today with, with the uh, hands-on workshop. You need to make sure that you have 4D transvaginal uh, transducer, 3D transabdominal probe, and then uh, the frequencies are provided. You need to make sure that with 2D imaging, you can um, recognize the difference between harmonics, high frequency scanning, and I can and show you um, the benefit of using the iPlayer and DKs. They are there to optimize image contrast resolution because, you know, within the skull, um, and, uh, the soft tissues can be quite challenging. And so I think knowing the tools that you have on your machines are very important, it's very important. And then you need to um, learn to use the 3D imaging, making sure that the volume angle should be just enough to capture the whole head. And then you need to use uh, 3D tools to optimize plane image in the three dimensions, the three orthogonal planes. So just a quick capture is that um, with, the, with the box, with the angle, of course that has to change with increasing gestation. The early gestation, the smaller the angle, and then the smaller the angle, the clearer the images, okay? And then uh, when it comes to capturing um, the volume, you need to choose the quality. In my opinion, of course, if it's a diagnostic scan for a fetal anomaly, a fetal brain anomaly, I would definitely use maximum quality. I get the best images. But then if the fetus is moving very fast, you might need to compromise and bring it down to a high two. And then the volume angle, as I mentioned, is just enough to capture the whole head. And I start with 65 degrees. But at 32 weeks, that might come up to 100. So you need to adjust accordingly. And then, um, so, I know this uh, later on, uh, Professor Wuchi Jin will cover uh, the protocol, but I have made reference uh, to the ISRON guidelines, and you can scan the QR code that takes you directly to the guidelines. And then essentially, within my uh, setting, um, uh, I have a list of indications as to when I will do a fetal brain scan. Not all, because I can't dedicate a fetal brain scan to every single patient, but certainly, I think following the ISRON guidelines is a good start, isn't it? When you're suspecting that there is a major, when you're suspecting a, a CNS abnormalities, spinal malformations, and then uh, when you have um, uh, a family history of imperishable CNS or spinal malformations, and then um, uh, previous pregnancy affected with fetal brain abnormalities, and then uh, previous with uh, congenital heart disease, and later on I will show some data suggesting why you must consider a fetal brain scan um, for fetuses with CHD, and also routinely scan um, uh, monoclonal twins in my fetal brain clinic. And then uh, certainly if you're suspecting congenital intrauterine infections such as CMB, you need to do a fetal brain scan. And then uh, if you are, uh, 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 if you know that there's exposure to teratogens, don't affect uh, your genesis. And then I also um, uh, see cases with uh, chromosomal microarray findings of unknown significance. This is actually quite challenging. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of BOUS, uh, but uh, because we really do not know um, the implication to uh, 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 neurodevelopment, therefore we also start seeing those cases. And I've also added uh, to the list um, uh, if there has been single intra intra death. Um, for a monoclonal twin, then I would start seeing the fetal brain. Ideally, uh, I would want to see it every two weekly, and, and, and I know that, uh, our COG recommendation is to do MR 
at six weeks post event, but then I think we're starting to see that um, uh, in our hands we can we can actually make up subtle findings um, two weeks after the event. And certainly we will want to see um, cases of no fetal anemia, pre and post transfusion to make sure. I think the, the when it comes to uh, chronic anemia, the Im impact on fetal growth development is perhaps different, but still I think much needs to be learned. And then in relation to fetal growth development, uh, we know that there's a process, there's a timetable, and then it begins in the third week of gestation and then continues to, to early adulthood. So one word of advice in relation to counseling is that when you do a fetal brain scan, I know parents are very anxious. They want to know whether their children will go to Cambridge, right? And then they just want you to tell them, but you have to be honest. You have to tell them the limitations of a fetal brain scan. Otherwise, no one will ever do a fetal brain scan because you're expected to predict the outcome, you know, by the age of 21. But you need to tell the parents that the fetal brain develops from early gestation till two years post delivery. And this process is ongoing, and there are many factors that will impact on the brain development. But what is important to recognize is, is that there's a timetable. And this is really helpful. Knowing the timetable allows us to actually evaluate whether fetal brain development is on par with gestation. And you can see that during, the, uh, during pregnancy, during fetal development, initially the brain is very smooth, and then it later, develop, uh, it later develops gyri. And by mid gestation, Neurons form, uh, form networks, and then low level processing areas such as sensory would mature first, and high order cognitive function would develop later. So, after delivery, the brain continues to develop. And so, what I tell parents is if I'm, I'm not suspecting a major structural anomaly, that's one thing. If I'm looking at from, um, I'm looking at field brain development. From that perspective, I need to warn them that uh, what I'm doing right now is to check that fetal brain development is on par with gestation, and that is already reassuring enough. Okay, so this is where my work started, um, uh, 2017, when I saw the work of Rituko Rituko Pu. She talked about the brain waste. Can you see the, the, the waste here? Yeah. And I was like, wow, you can look at brain waste. How can I tell whether it's fat or thin or slim? This is very, very subjective. Maybe in her eyes, she's, she was, she's been doing this for many years. Maybe she can get up very immediately. But I want to make this something doable for all of us. Make, make what measurable, uh, what, what everything that's measurable. And therefore, I decided to um, uh, convert this brain waste observation into a measurable parameter, and this is published uh, two years later in 2019. So what I recognize is that um, uh, above, uh, before 25 weeks, this is the superior portion of the um in an anterior coronal plane. And I recognize that above, uh, before 25 weeks, all of these um, uh, portions are above the midline. And after 25 weeks, then it's below the midline. And I thought, maybe I can create an angle to look at the progression from being positive to zero to negative. So when the horizontal line is about 25 weeks, I've got a zero degree, and anything above that is positive, anything below that is negative. And so we created this reference range. And then hopefully later on today, we'll, we'll uh, spend some time as to um, learn about how to acquire this plane. It has to be reproducible. So we, we spent like six months discussing how to acquire this image to create a reproducible measurement of the Southern Fisher angles. And then over time, we collected enough normal cases and we created this reference normal range. So the right Southern Fisher angles at the top, the left Southern Fisher angle uh, is at the bottom, and we plotted between 18 to 30 weeks. The reason why we haven't got, we are actually still looking into expanding the chart before 18 weeks and after 30 weeks. It's because, um, after, at least after 30 weeks, the anterior function now narrows down, making the scanning more challenging, and also we traditionally consider 32 weeks a month. So basically, we, we think initially let's go with 18 to 30 weeks. And then, as I mentioned, one part figure is uh, if it's 25 weeks, then the seven pressure should be horizontal at zero degree. This is very easy to remember. How reproducible this is, very reproducible. Um, one, one weekend, I flew to Osaka to do this study with Mitsuko. She recruited 30 cases 
for us to do this reproducible study. And basically, she scanned one case, she measured everything, and she unfroze the image. I scanned without taking the testator out, and then I resolved the measurement as well. And basically, it was a properly done reproducible study. Not that I measured her captured image, I basically took my own image, and she took her own image, and we were going to take each other's measurements. And you can see that it was very, very, very reproducible. The difference between the two of us for the right superficial angles was only 0.4 degree, and for the left was one degree. The difference between the two of us. And also, we demonstrated the uh, ICC being very, very good at 0.99. Anything above 8 is excellent. So we achieved highly reproducible uh, measurements between the two of us, and of course, with it herself, as the intra-observer variability, she also had excellent results as well. So this is just a quick video um, of manipulation of the of three orbital orbital plane. So we touched on that later on uh, today, and then uh, this video just shows you that we put up the horizontal line. It doesn't have to be up at any particular landmark as long as it's horizontal. Then you can then put on the second line, uh, which is on this um, uh, touching the echogenic portion of the superior portion of the silver fishes. And this is the left angle. Oh, no, this is the right angle. So basically, you know, I scan with my left and with the view I scan with my right. And you can then see the second angle. This line is touching the echogenic portion of the superior part of the superficies. And both of them are positive values. So the right angle is positive 34 degrees, and then the left angle is positive 39 degrees. And then you can cut it against the reference chart. And then, um, here is just, just to show you a, a transvaginal scan, and then um, just to start with, we go we put the transducer over the fontanelle, enter the fontanelle, so because that is the window whereby you can see the brain uh, very nicely. And of course, because with increasing gestation, the skull bone is going to cast a shadow, and then um, with obviously all the tools that we have on the machines, so we can minimize the shadows that we see. And then, uh, but what is important is, while well, I'm obsessed with getting the anterior coronal plane to measure the superficial angles, but I still need to do a comprehensive evaluation. So, uh, looking at the midline, sagittal plane, a full view of the corpus callosum, and rotating the transducer to sweep anteriorly and backwards posteriorly, and then, um, as this is what you're seeing right now, so going to the front. And mind you, the fetus is never so cooperative. You have to really hold on to the fetus to make sure that it doesn't escape out of your hands. So this is a quick sweep of what we do, and then um, uh, when, when it comes to a later gestation, you can tell the difference, right? That, that one was before 25 weeks. This is around 28 weeks, above 28 weeks. This was just monitoring for CMB, and, and um, uh, it was a case of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, secondary CMB, and then about um, but otherwise, no, no particular features. You can see the step that we take is that we start with the sagittal plane to look at the full length of the corpus callosum, and then rotating, fixing the probe, rotating the transducer, and uh, they can then get to the anterior coronal plane, as you see, and then sweeping forward, and then sweeping backwards. And at the same time, you can appreciate the, the gyro, and then uh, appreciating um, the lateral ventricles, because that is usually the place where you can pick up um, uh, paraventricular heterotopia, not in the typical transventricular plane. To pick up a uh, heterotopia, paraventricular heterotopia, I think it's important to do the para sagittal plane, and then, then you can see the full view of the, of the ventricles. So I just want to demonstrate to you an example of why it's good to use the superficial angles. This is a 34-year-old woman with no underlying disease herself in the first pregnancy, the first again at, at 12 weeks showed that uh, the new transducency was above 2 plus SD, then, then she paid for self-free DNA, and low risk of transmute 21, 18, and 13, that, that was high risk for 7211.23 duplication syndrome, Williams syndrome. And then she declined amyosynthesis, and then uh, within 21 weeks, anatomical survey, showing uh, moral functional megaly, and then um, Otherwise, nothing major, but she still declined amyosynthesis because she thought that her baby was like her. She was a bit slow, apparently, but then she was still having a normal life. She had slow development. She, she was like, my baby will be like me, and therefore I can accept that. And then um, she would not go for amyosynthesis despite multiple consultations. So these are her measurements, the, the baby's measurements. Um, 
at um, 23 weeks, and uh, you know, as I mentioned, at 25 weeks, the superficial average should be horizontal, and then this one was around 20 <coughs> weeks at 23 weeks, so three weeks delay. But she still insisted not of continuing, of course, I would respect her decision. And then uh, we did we did give her the best counsel that we could, so we monitored the, 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 the development of the superficial angles. And then um, at 27 weeks, you can see the superficial angles were horizontal, matching about 25 weeks, yes? And then you notice the quality of this image was from the trans of young scan. The baby was very quiet. There was no way of, because I could do a certified version in the clinic, and there was absolutely no way of turning. Because what, what we need to do sometimes is that we do a bit of moving, we do rely on the, on the fetus kicking, and so that the, the, the fetus would go into that perfect position. So actually, uh, we didn't want to struggle as well, and then so we decided to wait. And actually, by 30 weeks, it was a th uh, it's still a three weeks delay. Again, it was actually a chance of dumb no approach to start with, but I was like, this is my last time doing this uh, fetal brain assessment on ultrasound. Though I then, I, I was able to really achieve a valid version, and we did a chance of general scan, and then we went for MR imaging. So in the end, unfortunately, the baby was indeed born with seven q microduplication syndrome, uh, quite a big uh, uh, microduplication, and there was significant significant neurodevelopmental delay. This is just one way of showing how we can utilize this uh, submission animals for uh, monitoring of neurodevelopment. Then another case, just final case, and two cases to illustrate the importance of a comprehensive scan. And then this is a case of malformation of cortical development, 33 year old with no underlying disease, uh, second pregnancy, last pregnancy was uncomplicated, and snakely unremarkable. She didn't have self DNA testing, and then morphology scan showed bilateral uh, mild ventricular magnet, one centimeter, and there was a CVI, nothing major. CVI is uh, you know, a very of normal abnormality. And then uh, amniocentesis showed normal fetus, normal, uh, no, no CMP. So essentially, what I struggled with was a transabdominal scan. I don't know whether you appreciate that. I was not able to visualize the cerebellum very nicely. Normally, I wouldn't see that shadow. I don't know. So basically, I said, this is, I struggle actually quite a lot to get that perfect TCD. It was constant shadowing. So I said, we must proceed with um, a transvaginal scan. Even though all I could see was bilateral ventricular magnet. And that really prompted me to do a transvaginal scan. So this is the transvaginal scan. Can you approve? Oh, sorry. That needs to go back. Not sure what it's playing. It was, it was perfectly fine working. Let me take away the pointer because you need to appreciate this shift. Can you see the midline being shifted? And is that worrying? Does, does anybody know the diagnosis? It's actually pathognomonic to see this for a particular diagnosis. So the, sh the midline is shifted to one side, and actually we struggle with the TCD because you can appreciate that even the vermis is shifted to one side, okay? And then now we can see the CVI, and actually a sagittal plane was in particular alarming, yes? Then we did the uh, multi evaluation, and you can see that actually in order to get that perfect midline, of coccyphalosin being seen in full length, as well as seeing the midbrain and then the pons and then the vermis, you can see that I need to mark the line in a, in a slanted manner. So basically, the brain is shifted to one side, position is tilted. And that can be appreciated by 3D and then in a, in a very accurate manner. And then, um, so everything else is not alarming, uh, except the, the system of being prominent, but this Obviously, if it's isolated, it's not of any worry, but the midline shift was not worried. And I think transabdominal scan wouldn't have been able to pick it up so uh, uh, prominently. So essentially, uh, we uh, also uh, we basically utilized the multiplanar views, and then uh, we also picked up something else. We found that this part was particularly echogenic. I don't know, with subtle eyes, maybe not. Is we're running why it's more echogenic than the other side. It's like it's like an overgrowth. So we refer, uh, refer her for uh, MR, and MR didn't really actually see anything. So essentially, 
we had a diagnosis. Anyone with a diagnosis? All right, so this is definitely a case of malformation of vocal development. We proceeded with a termination of pregnancy, and uh, we did, with every case that we do, is a multidisciplinary approach. We do transvaginal scan, we do uh, transabdominal scan, and if we uh, have the opportunity to do MR imaging to complement our ultrasound findings, great. And then with every case, we try our best to preserve the fetus for post-mortem examination ourselves and so that we can understand the pathology. And the, these are just external views, nothing dramatic. And internal views showed obviously a bit of toxic on one side, as you can see, okay? So essentially, pathology report showed foci of polymicrogyria and neurohetrotopia. So I think heterotopia at that gestation of 20 weeks plus is very difficult, but certainly we were already able to see the polymicrogyria on ultrasound that could have, could have been picked up on MR. And then there were uh, foci of a neuroglial over migration that was more enlargement of the germinal zone, no uh, hemorrhage seen, and then the brain stem and cerebellum were largely unremarkable. And the, and the diagnosis was tuberculinopathy. Why do you see this case? You never forget tuberculinopathy. And then, then hopefully you will you take this home. And if you are suspecting even minor findings, on a transvaginal scan, please have the opportunity to proceed with a transvaginal scan. So this condition has critical effects in regulating uh, neuronal migration, mutations in tubular genes have been involved in large spectrum of brain development uh, disorders, and then uh, it can present with uh, various features, and then uh, and the outcome is ghastly with uh, retractable epilepsy and developmental delay, intellectual disability, and cerebral palsy. So. If this patient didn't come to me with mild tangible memory, I think we would have missed this diagnosis completely because I think a transvaginal scan is, a transvaginal brain scan is not standard practice. It is advanced practice. So take your messages. Uh, the measurement of the measure angle, as I've demonstrated to you, is reducible. And then we will hopefully have a chance to try it out later on today, and then uh, we can use the reference charts of, of the superficial angle uh, to uh, allow us to screen for neuronal migration disorders, and it will guide you to uh, refer for MR imaging or assessment by an expert neurosynologist. We, can, we should combine transabdominal transvaginal scan for comprehensive evaluation of your brain in high-risk cases. To finish up, I um, just want to uh, highlight the tools that you will get to play with later on today, the smart solution for fetal brain, and this is basically um, on, on a tool that you can then easily capture um, uh, the fetal brain uh, images, and then uh, actually the box itself, the ROI will automatically adjust to capture the fetal brain, and then um, it would then show you all the planes that you need to see, the bifid and the trans plane, the transcerebellar plane, and it allows you to measure the standard uh, uh, measurements in your ventricle, uh, for the ventricle, the uh, APD, and the circumference, etc. And then it improves um, acquisition rate, enhance your confidence, and etc. I think I think nowadays I need to move on and focus on looking at the details. And hopefully that the use of AI would, would assist with the basic uh, acquisition that I think that would really help. And in relation to intracranial volume, I'm not sure whether you've ever uh, done a fetal brain volume or other any other volumes. It takes ages. You need to divide the, 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 the 3D structure into different segments, and you need to do a manual process to capture the, the volume. And but now, uh, uh, with smart ICB, you can actually uh, rely on the machine to do it for you, and we'll be able to measure the volume of the brain uh, with a very simple approach. So I think uh, I will end at this point and, and uh, so thank you very much. I'm happy to take some questions perhaps later on if I have